Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you here. I'm Elise Gellerman, CEO of NetRF. I want to welcome all of you to Boston. Thanks to everyone who's joining us either in person or virtually. It's wonderful to get back together after many years of uh, just being uh, on a screen. And it's so good to see so many of you in three dimension here in the room. Today, we're proud to kick off the 2022 Margie and Robert E. Peterson Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Symposium. Robert Peterson, a pioneer in the automotive publishing industry, died from neuroendocrine cancer in 2007. Since then, there have been more discoveries and treatments than ever before, extending the length and quality of life for people with NETS. We've named our annual symposium in honor of the Petersons as a tribute to the transformational funding that their foundation has given NetRF since 2015. This funding has enabled NetRF to become the largest private funder of net research, increase our global impact, and award significant research grants to so many scientists right here in this room. We are grateful to the Peterson Foundation for its confidence in our work. This is our first in-person symposium since 2019, and we're so happy to be able to gather safely and collaborate here while still enabling members of our NetRF research community to join us online. We have about 200 uh, attendees in total, and our reach is truly international. At last check, you represent 20 states and 14 countries. NetRF has invested 34 million in research since 2005. NetRF funds innovative and proof of concept projects that other organizations do not fund. With a focus on basic and translational research, we have supported net researchers to advance our understanding of neuroendocrine tumors and contribute to the development of new and improved treatments. Along the way, we've been proud of the growing scientific community and those of you who have joined the net research field. We all know there is much more to explore and that's why we're here today. Patients are depending on our commitment to research and they are very excited to learn that all of you are working on their behalf. This is my sixth symposium and I'm always impressed by the discussion and the collegiality even if I do not completely understand the science, and thanks to all of you who are patient and explain it to me, I think this symposium is special and it truly is the embodiment of what NetRF does. I wanna thank John Conkey, NetRF's Director of Research for planning this symposium, as well as our Board of Scientific Advisors co-chairs, Don Quell, Don, where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> and Chrissy Thurwell. Thanks for your excellent guidance. Additional thanks to Cindy Lemke, who many of you have met. She is outside and she has been our meeting planner for this symposium and our entire NetRF team for all the hard work needed to make this event a success. From all of us at NetRF, our board, our staff, and on behalf of patients who are living with neuroendocrine cancer, thank you for your expertise and your collaboration. I look forward to the sessions during the next two days and wish you all a great meeting. Now I want to turn over the podium to John Conkey with some more details about today's session. Thanks, Elise. And uh, I want to welcome everyone from our uh, online platform, a new virtual platform. I hope you're all enjoying it. I also hope that everyone here in person is uh, uh, enjoying this new venue here on beautiful Boston Harbor. Uh, I think uh, it's situated next to the North End. It's really my favorite place to eat, so I think in the city. So I hope you guys get to get out there. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is what Elise mentioned about uh, our funding a lot of uh, work in the last, over the last 15 years. Uh, we've funded uh, over 115 grants now, and we've published way more than 150 papers. I think the papers are important because it shows that uh, that information that is learned from the research that we've funded is, uh, serves as a foundation that's expanding. And as that foundation expands, it grows, maybe not exponentially, but it grows faster and faster. And I think that that's really important in order to advance uh, movement towards new treatments. Uh, I think. A lot of those awardees are here at the meeting today, 
and I thank them all for coming. I think the other thing that uh, it also demonstrates is that our community is expanding as well. And that's another key goal that NetRF wants to do is expand this community, which has grown both in this country as well as internationally. And um, to that end, I want to uh, put a little plug in for our job board. The job board is accessible both virtually on our uh, virtual platform and as our attendees here, if you use that little QR code to scan in, it'll take you to a web, uh, web page that has these listed. There's a number of uh, really good postdoc opportunities there uh, from some really great labs. I think uh, anyone looking for something will find something great there for you. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention quickly was the uh, Net uh, Models Consortium. And this is a, a community group that we're trying to develop to address the problems of uh, the lack of models as well as the lack of their, uh, the ability to dis distribute them amongst the uh, scientific community. So we're gonna have a special session at the end of today. I hope you'll all stay and attend. And uh, we're just gonna go over some of the, uh, a brief summary of the models. We're not gonna talk about the specific questions so much as to really try and get interest from the community to join working groups. And that's where we want people to work together on focused areas to try and address these problems and, uh, and see if we can uh, really make a difference there. So with that, I'm gonna start session one, Net Models, and uh, introduce our uh, moderators here and have them start us off. All right, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. We're going to go back and forth. So the first speaker this morning is Talia Dayton, and she is from Barcelona European Molecular Biology Laboratory. She is going to tell us about patient-derived tumor organoids um, and how those models reveal druggable growth dependencies in neuroendocrine cancer. So Talia. So thank you, Don, for that introduction. And thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I am at the EMBL Barcelona. I just started a new group in September. But the work that I'll be telling you about is from my postdoctoral work in the lab of Hans Klavers. And it really forms the foundation for the group, the work of my new group. Um, so to begin, what I've done is list some of the key features of the tissue stem cell derived organoid system that I've been using that was, and that was pioneered by my postdoctoral mentor, Dr. Hans Klavers. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to one of the features, which is the fact that the media that we use is a completely defined media. So what this means is that we try to avoid using fetal bovine serum and instead try to recreate the in vivo niche of the cells that we are trying to grow by adding growth factors and different signaling molecules. So in the case of the small intestine, for example, because we knew that the small intestinal niche presents these cells with molecules such as uh, BMP inhibitors, Wnt signaling molecules, and EGF, we added each of these to the media and indeed found that each of them is important for maintaining the growth of these cells as organoids in culture. And so what this means is that this system is highly adaptable. So by changing the media in different ways, we've been able to grow organoids from a large array of different tissue types. In addition, we can use the system to study specific cell types by driving the differentiation of the stem cells in these cultures towards a specific cell fate. And most importantly for this presentation, we have been able to modify the media such that we can grow organoids from patient-derived tumor tissue. And in this case, we call the organoids patient-derived tumor organoids, or PDTOs. So PDTOs have proven to be a very powerful system for studying many aspects of tumor biology for many different kinds of tumors. And what I want to do right now is just highlight some of the key features. First of all, the PDTOs that I will be telling you about are lo grow long term, so that means that they can be expanded indefinitely as much as we know. They can be frozen and thawed as any other cell line, and they can also be manipulated much like cell lines. And in particular, I think the reason this system is very good for trying to study neuroendocrine tumors is because because we modify the culture conditions such that we can grow normal cells, we hypothesize that that means that this system is perhaps more amenable for also growing low-grade tumors such as neuroendocrine tumors. So 
As we all know in this room, neuroendocrine neoplasms are subdivided in two very broad categories, neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine carcinomas. And while rare, both of these categories represent a significant clinical challenge because there are no effective treatments for patients with metastatic neuroendocrine neoplasms, and even low-grade neuroendocrine tumors can metastasize at times. Now, this has been a real challenge to study and try to address because there are very few clinical cell-based models available for studying these kinds of tumors. And so when I started my postdoc uh, in, in the lab of Hans Clevers, I decided that I wanted to try to address this problem by trying to grow organoids from these tumors. And so in collaboration with a number of clinical centers in the Netherlands, we set out to build a biobank of organoids derived from patient uh, tumor tissue from either resections or biopsies. Now, what I'm showing you here is a summary of all the PDTO lines that we have generated. In particular, I want to highlight that we've been able to generate long-term growing uh, lung neuroendocrine tumor organoids. These are lung carcinoid PDTOs. We also have an example of what we think is a supracarcinoid, which is a more, high, uh, shall we say, high, uh, clinically aggressive subtype of neuroendocrine tumor in the lung. And we also have seven large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, or LCNEC PDTOs, derived from both pulmonary and extrapulmonary LCNECs. And we're looking forward to trying to expand this collection to try to uh, develop studies to specifically study LCNEC. We perform histological analysis, and what you can see is that the organoids recapitulate the key morphological features of the primary tumor they were derived from. We were also happy to see that one of the key defining features of the different subtypes of neuroendocrine neoplasms, the proliferation rate, is recapitulated by the organoids. Here you can see from KI67 staining that the PDTOs show the same level of KI67 positivity as the primary tumor tissue. And this does indeed translate to the proliferation rate of these PDTOs in culture. What I'm showing you here is the number of days that it took different organoids from, derived from tumors of different grades to reach a passage number of number five. So that means I was able to expand them in culture up to five times. And you can clearly see that the grade one derived tumors are much uh, uh, slower than the neuroendocrine carcinomas, for example. We've also performed extensive uh, molecular analysis, performing RNA sequencing and whole genome sequencing. Uh, and suffice to say that we do find that the PDTOs uh, recapitulate the key features of the primary tumors they were derived from, both at the levels of gene expression and the genetic alterations that we find. We've performed a lot of in-depth analysis, also looking at intertumor uh, heterogeneity of these PDTOs and the tumors, and we find that they're recapitulated. I want to uh, invite you to reach out to the rare cancers genomics teams, which perform these analyses, Matthew Full is here uh, in the audience, and I'm sure he can, he'd be happy to talk to you about some of this. So now that I hope I've convinced you that what we've generated is a model that recapitulates the key features of this human disease, I want to focus on another thing, and that is something that I talked about in the beginning. So in the beginning, I told you that when we try to generate an organoid media, we try to think about the in vivo microenvironment and recapitulate that in vitro. Now, in the case of neuroendocrine neoplasms, however, we didn't really know what was happening in vivo or what might be important for maintaining these cells, the growth of these cells. And so I wonder if now that we know, at least for some of these tumors, what allows them to grow in culture, can we use this information to try to identify therapeutic vulnerabilities that could be used to treat patients with these tumors? And so I want to highlight one example of this. So when we, we found that both neuroendocrine tumor and LCNEC PDTO lines are sensitive to the addition of a specific metabolite, nicotinamide, what you can see on the top uh, panel are images of a normal pancreas organoid line grown in different concentrations of nicotinamide, and what you can clearly see is that this line requires nicotinamide to grow out. The LCNEC lines, on the other hand, on the bottom panels, you can see clearly show the best outgrowth in the absence of nicotinamide. And so we hypothesized that perhaps the nicotinamide in the culture media was contributing to maintaining the metabolic balance of NAD and NADH by uh, contributing to the nicotinamide sal bi salvage biosynthesis pathway. And I'm showing that to you here. And so we reason that perhaps inhibiting this pathway would be of therapeutic benefit to patients. And so we treated uh, PDTOs with this inhibitor. And indeed, what we find is that the majority of, the, of these PDTOs show sub-nanomolar uh, IC50 values for this inhibitor. And just to give you a point of reference, when we're performing uh, drug assays, we usually will only follow up on can drug candidates that show an IC50 value of less than one micromolar. We're looking at less than one nanomolar here. 
Another thing that I really want to highlight about this study is that it maybe brings up something important uh, about neuroendocrine tumor biology. And that is, even though one of the hallmarks of cancer is this idea that tumors acquire growth factor independence, what we found is that some neuroendocrine tumors appear to be highly sensitive to the addition of growth factors. So they appear to be actually be dependent on the presence of growth factors in the media. Here I'm showing you an example of where we found this. So we, all of the lung net or carcinoid PDTO lines that we were able to grow are dependent on EGF. Here you have three examples of three different lines where we grew them in the presence of EGF or in the absence of EGF. And what you can clearly see is that without EGF, there's very little, if any, outgrowth. Because this was not something that had been previously reported before or really had been uh, mentioned as a feature of neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, we went back to the primary tumors that these organoid lines were derived from and asked whether or not they actually express the receptor for EGFR. And what we find is that indeed all of the tumors that show in vitro dependency on EGF show high levels of expression of membrane EGFR. Now this would suggest that perhaps these tumors or patients with these tumors could be treated with inhibitors of the EGFR. And so although because these lines are very slow growing, we haven't been able to test this extensively, we were able to test it in one lung carcinoid PDTO line, this LNET18 that you see here. And then we tested it in a, in a panel of more high grade tumors. And what you can see is that LNET18, which so, showed the growth factor dependence, indeed is sensitive to the treatment with the EGFR inhibitor, whereas all of the other lines uh, are not sensitive to this inhibition. To follow this up further, we performed uh, immunohistochemical analysis for EGFR in a panel of independently collected pulmonary uh, carcinoids. And indeed, we find that almost half of the tumors that we looked at show significant levels of expression of membrane EGFR, suggesting that a significant subset of patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors might be amenable to treatments with EGFR-targeted therapies. And so with that, I just want to sum up uh, the key points of what I've told you. We have generated the first described lung neuroendocrine tumor PDTOs and several LCNAC PDTOs, and we're looking to expand this collection. We have identified a potential therapeutic strategy for treating some patients with neuroendocrine neoplasms through inhibiting the nicotinamide salvage pathway. And we have also identified a subset of lung net PDTOs that are sensitive or are dependent on the presence of EGF in the media, suggesting that these tumors might have a therapeutic vulnerability to treatment with EGFR inhibitors or downstream pathway inhibitors as well. And so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, put a plug for my lab <laughs> that I just started. I will be, I've, I'm building my lab I just started in September on uh, using these organoid models to better understand neuro neuroendocrine neoplasm cancer biology. And in particular, we're interested in using these models to try to understand neuroendocrine neoplasm initiation and progression. And so uh, we are located at EMBL Barcelona. I'm very happy to collaborate. And also we are recruiting, so if you know any Anyone who might be interested, please have them reach out to me. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank, of course, my new institute, my postdoctoral mentor, Hans Clavers, who has been incredibly supportive throughout all this work, many members of the Clavers Lab, all of my collaborators, the patients who donated their tissue for these studies, and of course, NETRF, who made this study possible. Thanks so much, Talia. That was a beautiful talk. Um, I see George is raising his hand. Tyler, beautiful work. Thank you. Congratulations. I was one of those who didn't believe that it was possible to grow organoids that would be useful. Um, but you had, if I remember your slide right, you had eight well differentiated ileal. Out of how many did you try? But what's your favorite? At least 50. Uh, so I showed eight uh, SI net, ileal net PDTO lines, and I want to, to just state that those did not show long-term growth. So I'm not, I can't really call them PDTOs, but we have the lines. I think we can find what will make them grow, so I wanted to list them there as a resource. Um, and out of what I tried for SI net, ileal net uh, samples, it's at least 50, maybe closer to 100, actually, if we count all the metastases that I got every time that I, I would get two more samples and metastases. Yeah. So there's still work to be done for the ileal nets. Thanks. Uh, Eric? Very nice, Talia. Uh, back to the ileal net theme, you know, I think that's the challenge. It's like everyone was hoping that you know, you'd succeed in you know, propagating the ileal net PDTOs. And uh, what do you think is the hurdle or the um, obstacle that preventing you know, cell lines, you know, PDTOs? Yeah. Um, 
so there are two things that I think uh, impeded my progress on the ileal net PDTO lines. The first is that they often have a lot of fibroblast infiltration, and it was very difficult to separate the tumor cells from the fibroblast. I often had fibroblast outgrowth. So I'm working now on strategies to try to eliminate the fibroblasts from the beginning, or at least try to separate them at some point to try to focus on the tumor cells. That's one thing. The other thing that I think is important really is just identifying the growth factor. I think what we saw in the lung nets is that EGF was key. There's another half of, of, lung, of the subpopulation of lung nets that don't express EGFR, and I suspect they're sensitive to something else. And I think that's the same with ileal nets, and I am trying some um, different growth factors now. We're working on sort of a mid-throughport screening method to be able to screen many different growth factors and identify the ones that might work. I was intrigued that you can do both the carcinoma tumors and the large cell neuron crude carcinomas it seem to come from different sort of carcinogenic uh, uh, sources. Um, it looked like the EGFR was expressed in the neuro in the carcinoids, but not in the water cells. Yeah, that's correct. So, so we only looked at uh, actually for the EGFR analysis, we only looked at neuroendocrine tumors because those were the PDTOs that showed dependency on EGF. The LCNX do not show any dependency on 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 growth factors. There are some growth factors that help, but they will grow regardless of the presence of. What about small cell lung carcinoma? Yeah, so I was never able to get small cell lung uh, cancer samples uh, for in this project. Uh, I am working on, on new collaborations to do so, and I also know there's a group in Cologne that, that is working on doing small cell lung cancer organoids. Uh, I'm just wondering, usually cancer is heterogeneous, so when you grow the organoids, do you see that such kind of heterogeneous sitting in the organoids that two or three kinds of organoids yeah. are developing and whether you select the uh, different portion of the tumor to see uh, this kind of uh, differences? Yeah, so that's a very good question. We are very interested in intertumor heterogeneity. So uh, what we did, so we didn't take different parts of the tumor and grow different organoids. We didn't do that. But what we did do is we performed whole genome sequencing of the organoids and the tumors at very high sequencing depth. And the Rare Cancers Genomics team actually did very beautiful analysis looking at the subclonal populations in these tumors and the PDTOs. And we have very nice uh, data showing that the PDTOs maintain the major subclones of the primary tumor, uh, number one, and we also see that they maintain that we looked at the mutational signatures and the changes uh, of the mutational signatures across time, and we find that the PDTOs maintain the same uh, mutational processes that were ongoing in the primary tumor, suggesting that we can use these organoids to now try to understand how these uh, dynamics and subclonal populations might change in response to different perturbations, such as drug therapy. Terrific. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Wonderful to introduce uh, Dr. James Bibb from uh, UAB, uh, who's going to give us a whirlwind tour through his uh, animal neuroendocrine tumor models. Uh, and the title of his talk today is Mechanisms, Models, and Treatments for Neuroendocrine Tumors. So looking forward to it. Uh, I, I want to thank everybody for letting me come and, and speak for, for, uh, at this meeting. And, and uh, I want to show you what we're doing. Um, I, we come at this this problem of neuroendocrine cancers a bit from a different perspective, and so uh, it also I think you know requires me to to kind of come at it with some humility because we often aren't really uh, experts in what we're doing in this field, and so I'd just like to say that that you know some of the th stuff we're doing you know I get very excited about, but uh, we need help, uh, we need advice, we need uh, uh, we're going to get we're going to make mistakes, and I'm hoping that that as you see this maybe there'll be some some chances for uh, you to collaborate with us and to uh, uh, work with this group and this family of people who are committed to this. So we come in from the standpoint of neuronal signal transduction. And uh, I, I, w I just wanted to submit that if you think about uh, the brain, you think about neuroendocrine, uh, the system, uh, they're not completely unalike. Uh, you know, many uh, neuroendocrine cells will differentiate into neuronal processes if you just uh, give them uh, the right growth factors. They, they, some of the structures have similar layered characteristics, but chiefly, you know, they're activatable membranes. They have action potentials. They have the same synaptic or, or, uh, exocytosis, endocytosis cycles. They, they often release the same compound, uh, the same uh, ligands in, in the brain, they're neurotransmitters in these systems, then they, 
they become hormones. So they, they do overlap. Our entry into this starts way back about 20 years ago when my colleagues and I were characterizing uh, signaling pathways uh, that regulate dopamine neurotransmission. And we, we uh, found that there was this protein kinase CDK5 along with its cofactor P35 that was modulating dopamine neurotransmission. Uh, the thing about CDK5, it has a lot of normal physiological substrates and we, we have robust programs studying those in the brain, but it also has an aberrant form that causes it to uh, uh, cause problems in the brain and it underlies neurodegeneration and neural injury when its cofactor P35 is cleaved by, uh, into P25 by calpane. And you can do this by just treating brain tissue with an excitotoxic levels of uh, a glutamate receptor agonist in MDA. Well, we wanted to understand that a bit more, and so we engineered animals that would overexpress that P25 protein tagged with uh, GFP. The animals started to get uh, the, the predicted problems with their neural, uh, their neuronal circuitry uh, that we were targeting with the neuronal specific enolase promoter, but they all died uh, after six months, and that was because they all had 100% uh, penetrance um, bilateral um, medullary thyroid carcinomas, neuroendocrine cancers of the thyroid, and this cut off their trachea and they couldn't breathe. And so we were able to, uh, to understand how that occurred. And in 2013, we were able to publish this as our entry into the neuroendocrine cancer field. We went on, but you know, just thinking by logic, well, maybe it's in all neuroendocrine cancers, and, and it is. It's in, in all neuroendocrine cancers we can look at, and every neuroendocrine cancer, uh, human neuroendocrine cancer cell seems to be dependent on CDK5 for its growth and can be stopped by, uh, by inhibiting CDK5. We took advantage of the fact that we could turn these cancers on and then arrest them, and then the tissue would go, go back and be completely benign to start asking, well, what would, would be the downstream effectors using a, 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 some proteomics approaches? We identified with just a single pass about 14 pathways that we used high throughput screening that uh, clearly were involved in maintaining the neoplastic state of every neuroendocrine cancer cell line we could test. We then, uh, since these are phosphorylation sites, generate phosphorylation state-specific antibodies to these sites, and then began to ask, could could these predict which neuroendocrine cancers were dependent on CDK5? A considerable portion of them turned out to be, and in patient-derived xenografts, we were able to find that we could type uh, these tumors, and then the ones that had these, these biomarker uh, phosphorylation sites, uh, uh, it would predict they would respond to anti-CDK5 therapy, and we worked with Vector, Vector to deliver uh, a CDK5 compound to those, uh, those tumors. As that work extended on, and this is new work, we haven't, we're about to uh, submit this for publication. We started making other models, and we tr we've tried quite a few. We need to try more. We were trying to make small cell lung cancer using a different promoter. Uh, by default, this, uh, this actually caused the animals to, again, get uh, thyroid neuroendocrine cancer. But this thyroid neuroendocrine cancer happened really quickly, and so that was interesting. We, we now had sort of an indolent model, and we also had a rapid onset model characterizing some, some features that uh, distinguish these these patients. And so we began to ask, well, what could we learn about these models by comparing them? Uh, we first did uh, sequencing of uh, the exons of both these models. We found that the slower growing tumors had more mutations, perhaps because it took them longer to arise uh, than the faster growing tumors. Uh, and sort of the, the, the mutations they had were, were distinguishable in that the slow growing tumors tended to have mutations that, that circled around actin and cytoskeletal dynamics, whereas the fast endocrine tumors tended to have mutations that centered around metabolism and fatty acid metabolism. We took these and uh, uh, these, uh, these databases and cross referenced them to human uh, uh, databases for uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma mutations and saw there was considerable overlap in these two pathways and these could perhaps be used to distinguish slow and fast growing uh, human tumors, but it suggests to some degree we are accurately modeling these, the, these human diseases with these animal models, even though they started with the same uh, activation, uh, the same kind of mutation, and, and we were activating aberrant CDK5 by using different promoters, we're getting a, a, a different uh, set. And it, 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 I think it underlines the spectrum of these diseases that can arise from particular mutational backgrounds and underlines how we need to understand the signaling to, uh, to be able to kind of identify common, uh, common denominators that could be targeted. We went on to, to do the RNA-seq for these. Uh, these data, again, kind of underlined the, the distinctness between fast and slow-growing slow uh, uh, thyroid tumors, and uh, the, 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 the slow-growing ones tended to have cytoskeletal uh, gene expression changes, whereas the, uh, uh, the uh, fast-growing tumors had metabolic changes. And when we, when we um, uh, integrate the, the mutational uh, background with the RNA, I mean, the, the gene expression uh, landscapes, what we see is there's a considerable amount of interaction between those mutations and the changes of genes. So this, this 
this is consistent between uh, the DNA and the RNA. Well, that tells us we can characterize fast and we, we can make models that, that can, can give us different kinds of uh, the human tumors, but how, how can we kind of relate uh, these pathways more to uh, the human disease? And I showed you where we had, we had been able to see uh, protein phosphorylation sites as biomarkers of aberrant CDK5-driven tumors. And so we've been working with the NCI's uh, uh, antibody characterization uh, lab to generate uh, monoclonal recombinant antibodies that would allow us a more accurate diagnostic. First, working in, in mouse cells and then moving to uh, uh, mouse tumors, then finally to human cells, and then finally human tumors and uh, with tissue microwaves uh, that Renata Jaskula Stuhl uh, had helped us with, along with uh, Brendan Herring, uh, we were able to see that a considerable portion of patients with MTC have, uh, uh, are driven by anti-CDK5, uh, are, are by aberrant CDK5, and we're still kind of quantitating to see what portion of that is. But uh, that's the direction we're going on. We hope to extend that to other neuroendocrine cancers. Uh, speaking of other neuroendocrine cancers, we also made uh, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine cancers using the same strategy, this time driving aberrant CDK5 uh, th uh, through the expression of P25 under control of the insulin promoter. Uh, these, these tumors uh, come up uh, fairly slowly. Uh, and they are uh, they are heterogeneous in that that they are non-functional, a few are functional, a uh, few secrete uh, insulin. Uh, most of them actually uh, express insulin, uh, and so uh, we've been able to make those tumors. We've been able to uh, survey their their uh, genetic landscapes and relate those also to to human mutations. Uh, Rachel Gunter, along with uh, uh, Bart Rose, have been taking these models and working to develop. Uh, allografts of these so that we could have animals that have intact immune systems but expand them and not have to wait so long. This is a work in progress. It has mixed success. I think Talia's work might be helpful to us uh, in trying to figure out what it takes to keep these growing. They all they, they sometimes slip into uh, uh, sarcomas and other populations. They don't hold their, their identity, but it's working and we can passage these and amplify our tumors in, so that we have many mice instead of just a few coming at any, any given time. And we're hoping that that'll be useful uh, to some of you so that you can screen uh, drugs and, and, and treatments. We also uh, um, uh, caused field, uh, field chromocytoma. Uh, we did this by targeting uh, adrenal medulla cells. We found that, that SDHB mutations, which cause these cancers, uh, trigger the activation of succinate receptors, uh, destabilizing calcium, and this uh, in the end turns out to activate the calpane pathway, activating aberrant CDK5, and then um, uh, uh, activating a, a, a cascade, uh, which ultimately leads to um, uh, leads to uh, inactivation of AMP kinase. Once AMP kinase is off, uh, then you can't do anything about. Um, uh, uh, these cells uh, to keep them from growing, except you can reactivate AMP kinase or inhibit CDK5. So uh, as we learn more about these novel cascades and how uh, impaired metabolism is turning on, uh, turning off uh, cell checkpoints, uh, we're, we're finding new ways that we might be able to combine therapies. So one of the things we've done is to, to screen for CDK5 inhibitors. I've been doing this for a long time. We've got very potent inhibitors. For the most part, they don't have a good enough separation between their efficacy and their toxicity. And we're working very hard uh, to try to resolve that. We have some new, new approaches that we're, we're using to try to get that separation. And we're also now going after a different class of molecules. This is, these molecules started with Roscovitine. And this is Laurent and Valerie and, and Roscoff. I saw them a few weeks ago. And they live at this beautiful place. And uh, uh, he's, he's isolated most of these compounds started with sea sponges and, and they're producing sea sponges. So we've been able to use those compounds to find their toxic levels and then treat different kinds of animal models and show that we can, um, uh, we can stop these tumors from growing. So these end up being experimental treatments. Our goal really is to get a treatment that has efficacy, low toxicity, probably vector targeted delivery, and then couple those to uh, those antibodies that I was talking about so that we have a diagnostic that would predict which tumors would respond. And that way we can, uh, uh, we can uh, use some precision me medicine to, to direct anti-CDK5 therapies. So I've shown you aberrant CDK5 drives a significant portion of neuroendocrine tumors. I've shown that we have uh, so far made models of MTC, PNETs, uh, and, and FIO. We can make more of these. 
uh, we, can, we can show that metabolic impairment triggers proneoplastic and uh, CDK5-dependent net proliferation. Uh, the downstream effector phosphorylation sites can serve as diagnostic uh, uh, predictors that can guide anti-CDK5 therapy and anti-CDK5 drugs may, de may be developed that can be uh, uh, guided as a precis precision medicine approach. Uh, I want to thank all the people. I didn't get uh, quite the time to mention all the people in the work that's contributed to this. Uh, and again, I'm very grateful. And I, I could not, because of HR's limitations, limitations, post jobs needed. But uh, if any of you know anybody who wants to come and, and work in my lab, uh, we have uh, plenty of plenty of room right now for people to come and work on these projects, even if they're between labs and we, I mean, or, you know, we can, we can share. I'm happy to send some of my people to some of you guys' labs too. So that's it. Thanks for my time. I, I wanted to ask you, I'm very curious about the two, the fast burn and the slow burn treatments and the use of different promoters. Do you think that's implying a different cell of origin and how you look at that? Can you repeat the question? Um, what is it about these fast and slow growing tumors that make them different? And the answer is we don't know. This is something that, you know, I could use some help. This is not such a, an area of strength for me. We, it's clear that they're changing their gene expression. They're changing their, their mutational uh, patterns. They have different promoters uh, driving them. But as far as what those cells identities are, I mean, could we isolate? We've been able to grow cells from that NSC model. We haven't even begun to try to grow cells from that CGRP model. They might be more robust uh, cells. So all that remains to be done, and I, I hope I get to talk to you and, and share some of our tumors and some of our cells with you so that you could play with them. The usefulness of mice, obvious, is if you can get those going back in as allografts with animals with intact immune systems, it would really be uh, an advantage for, for, for screening drugs and treatments. But for those, those peanuts that we're trying to, trying to promulgate, uh, the fact that eventually they kind of poop out and they don't grow really strong suggests that what you're doing is what we need to be incorporating, and I'd love to share some of those cells and tumors with you, don't you think, Don? Don's been working on this too, and we're kind of like, we know we can figure this out, but it, it's. I think what you're doing is going to be the solution to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you could you maybe shed some light on how barren action cytoskeletal regulation is causing these slow growing tumors? CDK5 clearly targets some proteins that are modulating the cytoskeletal. And we have a study about the gut and the brain and how they interact. And we did a lot of gene expression and proteomics. And we're studying a pathway uh, by which CDK5 regulates a protein called beta adducin 2 that, that mediates uh, uh, cytoskeletal uh, um, proliferation. And in the brain, it's controlling structural plasticity. And, and it's targeted when you have bowel inflammation, you don't think so well. And, and that's because you're losing synaptic input, we think. So maybe that's a pathway, but I think there's probably a lot of parallel pathways. We just need to dig into uh, the body. You know, the thing about doing these large, high throughput data sets is you got to val validate something, but it leaves a lot of things undone. I think, you know, we're just seeing in this field and other fields, there's these large data sets and we're just going to, uh, it's going to take decades to mine those for what's important and what's not. So I think we need to get further into it. Um, for the aberrant uh, CDK5, then um, I may have missed this, but what is what is it in the structure that's different? Like, is it? Affecting the kinase That's it. Thanks for, for asking that question now on safe, safe ground. Uh, uh, it really is, uh, it, it's not that it activates it. CDK5 has this kind of slow trudging, and I think of them like a cow eating grass in the, in the field. It's low kinetics, it just phosphorylates things routinely and maintains, charges a lot of things so that when activation occurs, it can be dephosphorylated as calcium rushes in, and that triggers this kind of clockwork of endocytosis and exocytosis so the cells don't explode or implode. So that's what it's there to do is phosphorylating, maintaining these things. But then it, it comes from the cell cycle and, and it's a cycle independent kinase with this P35 and it really kind of wants to be a cell cycle kinase. So when calpane stumbles, you know, gets activated in a, in a more global manner because loss of calcium, you lose the first 100 amino acids. It just goes off the ranch then. It, it absolutely uh, takes off and it phosphorylates things that it shouldn't be phosphorylating. So all these proteomics are really looking at these aberrant sites. So well, it's changing the substrates. 
Yeah, it's it's not so much the activation as relocalization and change of substrates. But we, we mostly had drugs to target the ATP binding site, and all kinases have the same ATP binding site. And so that's why we're getting a lot of toxicity and off-target effects. Right now we're constructing a drug screen that we hope will allow us to get a bigger peptidomimetic molecule that will selectively take away CDK5 and P35 interactions. And if we can do if we can get that kind of compound, I think it'll have a lot more specificity and and, and might be more useful, although as it gets bigger, we're going to have to think about vector delivery uh, 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 pathways. But, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of, you know, high on my own fumes a bit uh, because, we're, you know, CDK5 and this aberrant stuff, uh, we really need collaborators that are interested in, in looking at this with us. We Please validate our work. Please uh, ask for our, our animals and our constructs and, and these things because I think, I think this is ripe. It doesn't have to stay on this, this, this kinase. It, it very quickly goes downstream into other pathways, but it is seems to be some sort of lead that we're getting. And I think it has to do with that role in, uh, that these, these cells have, common role in secretion. Chrissy? Just one last one. Quick question. So you, you've convinced me that if we target CDK5, we could perhaps cure all nets. <laughs> Not all. I, I, I mean, I'm guessing 50% of of all that we've looked at have uh, uh, aberrant CDK5 as one of the things, and it's not the only thing that's driving these these tumors. Yeah. Signaling, tumorigenic signaling is a network. It just tends to be an important node, and it tends to hit a lot of downstream things, like many cyclin dependent kinases that get out of hand. Do like RB uh, uh, is a tumor tumor repressor pathways, AMP kinase. These kind of things are absolutely critical to keeping a cell in check. But what would you predict would be the biggest off-target? Um, consequences of hitting CDK5? Well, if it doesn't get in the brain, you're kind of safe. And I've worked so hard to get CDK5 inhibitors into the brain. And we finally, this just this year, reported our first uh, brain-specific CDK5 inhibitor. And it's going to enhance cognition and be neuroprotective, be antidepressive and anti-addictive. And we're really pushing that. So as long as you're out of the brain, you're in pretty good shape. It, it seems to be these neuroendocrine uh, cells would be the second target. Maybe, I mean, there's been a lot of evidence that a normal CDK5 is important for maintaining uh, beta islets. And, and insulin function. So it may be if we targeted all CDK5 inhibition, uh, we would maybe impair other endocrinological functions. But if we can get to that CDK5 P25 that doesn't, go, well, it wouldn't be too bad if that went into the brain, then maybe we'd have something more specific. And I, I, I'd love to tell you more about that, that drug screen, but that's part of what we're doing. So what would be the impact of, of CDK5 and progenitor cells for neuroendocrine pathways and the expression in stem cells when you're seeing this effect in multiple sort of neuroendocrine uh, tumors and what have you learned from glioblastomas uh, as well which is obviously a cousin related to neuroendocrine tumors that's a great question. I haven't delved in, into glioblastomas. I, I know there's some ev some evidence that it's there in glial cells. Clearly, it's, it has a bigger predominant role to play in in neurons than their glial uh, partners. But I, I I can't say to what degree it actually is 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 as important in in glioblastoma. It is clearly important in colorectal cancer and probably important at the, uh, at melanoma uh, metastasis phase. And and I just had surgery and am cured of a melanoma. Uh, so, uh, you know, what, what, what you study gets to you in one way or another. But, but you were saying, what does it have to do with the development of the neuroendocrine system? And I would just have to say that um, um, when you knock out CDK5 constitutively, uh, the animals will be resorbed during embryogenesis. So it has, and then if you knock out its cofactor, it has another cofactor called P39. The, the animal's normal, but its cortex is upside down, if you can believe that. And, and it really is. And, and so, um, um, we've been using conditional knockouts to knock out an adult animals. I don't know of anybody who's tried to get further into driving it in specific cells at specific developmental periods. We need more specific neuroendocrine cell promoters. And I, I have an idea about how to do that, but uh, uh, that's really what we're going to need if we're going to be able to probe that. But to be able to target it just in, in one neuroendocrine cell or another at a particular point in development to see how that's going to alter neuroendocrine function, I think it remains to be seen. Our next speaker is someone who I know very well. She is Dr. Poe Hinier from the University of Iowa and a wonderful colleague. Uh, she will be telling us about improving small bowel net therapy by targeting serotonin metabolism. Hi, um, thank you for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak. 
Um, so today I'll tell you a little bit more about our work on SBNet. Um, I have no disclosure. Um, in Iowa, actually our clinician sees a lot of patients with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. Um, but unfortunately, this is the, the very difficult category of neuroendocrine tumor that, uh, to study because there's actually very little models for this. And, but there's a real need too because clinically, our clinician tells us that there, there's actually no good drugs for small bowel neuroendocrine uh, tumors. And surgery is pretty much the, the curative um, procedure for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. So uh, for this reason, uh, we invested a lot of effort into developing um, ways to culture these tumor cells from patient samples. And three years ago, we published this uh, protocol where we showed that we can actually grow uh, small bowel neuroendocrine tumor cells when we extract it from patient tumors. So they grow as these little spheroids. We can keep them going for several months, but as you can see in B here in this in, in the chart, um, they don't grow very fast. They take like 14 days to grow, and afterward, they kind of plateau off. Um, however, within this time frame, we characterized them and we showed that they actually um, very, they are very recapitulative of the patient tumor cells. They have all the markers as shown uh, in C and D. You can see um, synaptophysin, chromogranin A, SSTR2. You can also see like CDX2 and serotonin um, for, for small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. And we saw that we can also use this, um, uh, these tumor cells to do drug testing and they uh, we can find um, we can do drug sensitivity profiles and all that so um, from that point on we actually uh, expanded our, our collection so we move uh, to uh, uh, trying to culture other um, neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine carcinoma uh, um, tumor cells as well and in here I'm showing uh, three different subtypes small bowel neuroendocrine tumor pancreas neuroendocrine tumor and um, neuroendocrine carcinoma. As we can see here, the, the, the spheroids, they, they are very recapitulative of um, the patient tumors or the PDX tumor um, in terms of KI67, uh, but they also have their respective uh, markers such as serotonin or for the PNET, um, you have PAC6 and islet one um, And for the neuroendocrine carcinoma, you sometimes have like um, these interesting markers such as um, CXCR4 that could be used for for uh, therapy development and all that. So, um, um, so knowing that we can do this, uh, we then became a little bit more ambitious and then we uh, proceed with taking 20 uh, patient and uh, PDX tumors and then um, put them in culture um, so that we can perform a systematic drug screen against a panel of 175 compounds. So these are actually, um, uh, 145 of them are FDA approved anti-cancer drugs. Eight of them are selected by our lab based on previous studies, um, and 20 of them are just actually just uh, structurally um, diverse compound. They're, they're not known to be uh, specific inhibitors or something, but we thought we'd throw that in as a feasibility and maybe as a, a new avenue in the future. Um, so, so then we performed these um, drug testing. Um, for in the short period of time, um, and after seven days, we scored them for viability. Um, and as you can imagine, this is a, a tremendous amount of work, and, and, and it's really thanks to Dr. Howe, Dr. Fields, and then our residents who are uh, really courageous at taking uh, on these projects. And I think they don't like me very much for asking to do this type of study. Um, but overall, um, this is a summary of our drug screen data. As you can see, so each row is a patient sample and in each column is a drug. And uh, we've classified, we put uh, the SB net on top and then the, the P net in the middle and then the uh, three neck in the bottom. And you can overall, um, so blue indicates that they are sensitive to the drug and then uh, white or 
or red, meaning they're not sensitive. Um, as you can see, there, the profiles of these three subtypes are actually quite different. There are some similarity, and I'll just uh, summarize here. So for the small uh, boundary endocrine tumors, we found that they are actually really uh, drug resistant. They are, when we use a 50% uh, drug sensitivity uh, cutoff, we only found 21 drugs of the 175 compounds that we tested that actually um, uh, can kill these uh, small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, more than 50%. For the PNET, um, and this is where it gets a, quite interesting because they are also low grade, they, so, uh, but yet they are sensitive to 50 of the drugs that we tested. Um, and then for the neuroendocrine carcinoma spheroid, they are actually uh, sensitive to uh, a lot more drugs. And mostly uh, we think because they are actually um, growing very fast, so they are sensitive to the antineoplastic compounds. Um, but but uh, I want to come back to the, the small bowel neuroendocrine tumor spheroid because I think we've touched on um, a, a very unique feature of this uh, and also using these patient spheroid for drug screen. Um, so we we, we are the same people who do this, but yet uh, it's what this study is telling us is that these tumor spheroid, they retain specific features of the tumor. And um, because the small, uh, like we didn't really expect this result when we went in. And, and yet uh, after the screen, we found that, well, it, it's what we saw with the patient. So the small bowel endocrine tumors are actually quite drug resistant. So what could this be? What, what is the, the, why are they so drug resistant? So one thing that we, we, we thought we, that just came up is, 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 and everybody and every pathologist would, would, would tell us, is, well, well, maybe it's the serotonin. They produce tons of serotonin. So um, then um, I've convinced our um, awesome pathologist, uh, Dr. Andrew Belize, to look at this a little bit deeper. And uh, he compiled this uh, table here where uh, he looked at um, small bowel neuroendocrine tumor compared to peanuts. And as you can see, uh, the level of CDX2 and serotonin is super high in small bowel neuroendocrine tumor compared to peanuts. And so, so, so then we, we want to look at the, the, the rate limiting enzyme that makes serotonin. And this is an enzyme called tryptophan hydroxylase 1. It is the, the rate limiting enzyme and, and it's actually highly expressed in small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. Um, we can see this by um, RNA sequencing data, or by gene expression, by qPCR, or by um, staining with specific antibody as shown here, either um, immunofluorescence or immunohistochemistry, uh, and they are very specific to the neuroendocrine tumor cells, as you can see in, nicely in panel B. It's really in the tumor cells and not the fibroblasts and all that. So, so this, this makes us want to look further into this pathway. Um, and then, so this is why we started to target this pathway, either using the specific inhibitor called uh, telotristat ethyl, TE, um, and also knocking down TPH1. Um, and as you can see uh, on the top panels, uh, these are the in vitro uh, results. And what we've seen, and, and this has actually been tested and published by other labs as well, in vitro, there's actually not much different when either we use the um, inhibitor or when we knock down the gene. Um, but However, it gets more interesting when we actually take these knockdown cell line and we put it into uh, mice. We saw that there's actually a dramatic um, change in terms of uh, tumor growth. So meaning that uh, serotonin metabolism is actually uh, is probably very important for uh, neuroendocrine, neuroendocrine tumor growth. Um, so um, we can, um, here I'm showing that we can actually recapitulate this phenotype by using the inhibitor, uh, telotristat ethyl, and we use this in the sub-Q models in A, B, and C, and then in D we are showing data where we use the metastatic um, tumor model um, in collaboration with Don's lab, uh, where we follow the uh, luminescent cells, and, and we can also see decrease in tumor growth in um, the metastatic model. 
Um, however, um, as, as clinician will tell you, well, uh, some patients are on TE, but their tumors are still growing. So, so I think it, it is true. It, it, it's slowing down the growth, but it's not killing it. So this is what makes us want to go a, a, another step further, which is to actually um, test it in combination with uh, neuroendocrine tumor therapy. So here uh, in F, we combine it with sunitinib, and we can see that we can actually uh, further improve um, inhibit tumor growth growth. So, um, so what's the mechanism? Uh, well, uh, serotonin actually um, uh, has been reported to be important in uh, angiogenesis, so we think that's, that's important. It's also been uh, published that it's involved in, um, in, in, in um, um, promoting extracellular matrix um, expression and all that, so I th we think that is important too. But uh, I'm, I'm a new investigator and I'm hoping to find a little niche for my own lab so this is why um, I thought that maybe we can try to do something new. And, and, and looking into the literature, um, we found that actually so serotonin can be added to a protein. So you, you, everybody's familiar with uh, phos phosphorylation, acetylation, and all that. But uh, serotonin um, is a post-translational modification uh, that is a little bit less known. Uh, it is where the serotonin residue is actually added onto the side chain of a glutamine residue of a protein. Um, and there are some uh, actually uh, publications already um, almost 20 years ago from uh, Michael Bader's lab where we show that there's um, a serotonylation of row A and then other people have published and all that. But the latest one is actually histone H3 that we can serotonylated. So we thought we would go down this route and um, we tested the serotonin inhibitor um, and then we saw that actually uh, histone H3, there is less serotonylation on histone H3 and uh, we also found that some genes, like these are um, um, actually um, um, drug metabolizing gene and also efflux flux that pump out drugs. And so we think that this could be a very interesting avenue because uh, maybe they're producing a lot of these uh, detox um, uh, genes and, uh, or proteins, and that's why they are drug resistant. Um, so moving forward, um, I'm very happy that um, my collaborator, uh, Marie Migou at uh, um, uh, University of South Alabama helped us make this uh, propagal form of serotonin, uh, which can allow us to like culture them and use it in a, a cell culture culture experiment and do a click experiment where we can attach it to fluorescent compound, for example. And I've somehow convinced my very courageous student, uh, Dean Tao, to do this experiment, but he's having awesome results here. As you can see, we can take the protein after you culture the cells and then do, um, do a gel, and we can actually locate the um, serotonylated protein onto the gel or by Western blots. So uh, we don't know what these are yet, but we are in the process of finding out. So in summary, I just want to say that uh, we started started with culturing small, uh, like the uh, different types of neuroendocrine tumor cells, and uh, we found that SPNet uh, spheroids are really highly drug resistant, and we think that serotonin is actually an important key factor here, and we are trying to identify this mechanism of drug resistance. So thank you very much for your time. I would like to thank all my team and all the trainees who did this work. Thank you. I wonder uh, if you add serotonin, put it in their diet, just put it in their water, if it'll speed the tumors back up as, as one way to kind of play with on and off. Also, you know, these cells love to make them some serotonin, don't they? And so uh, blocking TPH1 is, is a great strategy, but as you know, it gets into other pathways very quickly. There are inhibitors to TDO, IDO that will keep it out of uh, the endolin pathway or the lecanurinic pathway and I wondered if you know if you further kind of jam up serotonin on these cells it might it might be a, a, a way to kind of really trap them in, in their state. Yeah, thank you, James, for um, these comments. So uh, James raised the fact that we can actually, uh, can we modulate tumor uh, growth or stop tumor growth by um, feeding more serotonin or inhibiting serotonin using other pathway? Um, and, and I think you're, 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 you're absolutely right. And actually looking into the um, metabolic uh, biosynthesis pathway, actually, uh, so we, we, we know, uh, I, I know, I come from uh, actually NAD metabolism. So thank you, Talia, for uh, introducing this subject. This is actually, you know, one of those things that people run away from after. 
after that you tell them NAD biosynthesis. Um, but we actually, so we know that actually uh, serotonin biosynthesis require NADPH. And so when you actually use like the, the inhibitor that Talia mentioned, uh, the NAMPT inhibitor FK866, um, you can actually reduce um, um, serotonin uh, production that way as well. So um, this is a, actually a nice angle to go in and we found uh, also that you know you can actually add the two inhibitors together and, and so there's definitely uh, a, a great avenue there. Um, uh, I, we have some preliminary data with the NAMPT inhibitor that I'm, I didn't have time to show. Look at the tryptophan metabolome. Um, we have looked at, uh, so that's one way, that's pretty much the most sensitive way to quantify ser serotonin and all the uh, precursor because the antibodies are not very uh, great because the reason is that the s serotonin is a small molecule. So the way how they made the antibody is actually they fix it onto BSA and then they inject the BSA serotonin into the rabbit or the mouse. And so that's why you, you, know, there, you, you always have to be a little bit careful with those uh, antibody experiments. I mean, there's always like, right, it's always, yeah, there's the washing step. So it's a, an affinity uh, prob problem for sure. Uh, just a basic question from the dumb clinician. Uh, for, the, for the mouse experiments with the discrepancy between the in vitro and in vivo results, were the immune systems intact or deficient? Um, so yes, we are using uh, immune compromise model at the moment, uh, but we are uh, um, trying to develop uh, other immune competence, so, so mouse uh, neuroendocrine tumor models, and we hope to, to test that in the future. I have one methodological question. You try to combine uh, sunitinib uh, with your drug. So I'm just wondering how much uh, dose you're uh, using for in vitro and in vivo experiment for the sunitinib. Mm, okay, so, well, yeah, so uh, I guess it, it's not, it's hard. I mean, in vitro, um, cis, oh, yeah, so um, the question is um, how much um, sunitinib are we using in vitro compared to in vitro experiments, right? Um, well, in vitro, we can easily do a dose response and then see which concentration we can use. And so that's what we, we did. And it's also based on published work. Um, for in vivo, uh, we, uh, tr well, sunitinib actually is not that great by itself, but uh, so we, but other people have used it and we use the same concentration. I think it's uh, 20, uh, five milligrams per kilograms, uh, something like that. But I'll, I'll double check and let you know. But but yeah, I, I, it's pretty much based on previous publications. Um, so you're working on spheroids, yeah. and Talia is working on organoids. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, we're using these different words. Are, do we have clear definitions of, of why yours is different? And oh, okay. Well, I think um, so. The, I think the main difference is actually um, so uh, Talia is growing them in the stem cell um, media formulation, and so so I think um, technically, so reviewers will let her call her uh, tumor cells organoids. But because I am using uh, pretty much uh, uh, for a cocktail where. It's basically um, 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 an enriched medium with FBS, uh, so reviewers don't like us to call them organoids, so they made us call them spheroids. So I was, you know, I guess we have to pick our battles, and I'm like, okay, whatever. If you want me to call them spheroids, I will call them spheroids as long as you accept my paper kind of thing. We're on to our uh, final talk, which is going to be virtual. Right. It's from Patricia De Gea's lab, uh, as well in collaboration, um, who's at uh, UT San Antonio, um, with um, Alice Saragni, uh, who's at UCL UCLA. This is a really nice NetRF-supported collaboration, uh, where they've been working to develop pheochromocytoma should we call them organoids, uh, a, 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 as a model and, and looking for uh, drug treatments. And it's a virtual talk. Hi, I'm Patricia Daya from the UT Health San Antonio. And I'm Alice Saragni from UCLA. We are going to present today a project on a few chromocytoma organoid uh, models uh, funded by NetRF. And other than our uh, award and we have no conflicts of interest. 
So a few chromocytomas and paragangliomas, or PPGLs for short, are tumors derived from the neurocrest that can produce catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine. These tumors are components of several hereditary tumor syndromes, and for the most part, they are benign, although 15% can evolve to metastasis. These are genetically quiet tumors that have single driver events that are mutually exclusive, so usually one mutation explains the tumor for the most part. And about 40% of them have a germline mutation, so it's an unusually high hereditary cause. These tumors are classified into molecular groups, and uniquely, one of the groups is uh, characterized by mutations involving the hypoxia pathway, and they are characterized by HIF2 stabilization. So these are tumors that cannot have, there are still some gaps, and their behavior is not predictable. So we cannot anticipate those that will evolve with metastasis or have a broader tumor spectrum. They suffer from very few mental models available, and patients that evolve with aggressive disease have limited therapies. So the goals of our project were to develop a BPGL model that could help us understand biology and at the same time serve as a screening platform for drug sensitivity. So to do that, we are um, leveraging tumor organoids. These are uh, three-dimensional models of disease that can be established from any number of tissues, whether normal or tumors. They can be readily established using primary cells derived from surgeries, and they allow us to maintain components of the microenvironment, cell-cell interactions, um, extracellular matrix components. And ultimately, the reason why we like to use this type of models is because us, as well as so many other people in the field over the past five years or so, have shown how these are really good at recapitulating the patient drug response ex vivo. The way in which we approach three-dimensional culture for drug screening is through our miniaturized ring platform. The way in which we grow cells and tumor organoids is by developing this mini ring of matrigel and cells at the periphery of the well. This approach allows us to use few cells. We don't need to expand in vitro. We don't need to passage these cells unless we want to. And it allows us to reach medium to high throughput because the center is empty. We can use any type of automation, robotics, liquid handler to perform screenings. Our uh, paradigm is as follows. We obtain cells from surgery. We dissociate the tissue into a cell suspension and seed our uh, mini ring. We let the organoid establish over two to three days, followed by drug treatment. We typically perform two drug treatments over two consecutive days. And 24 hours after the last drug treatment, we dissociate the um, extracellular matrix component and quantify the effect of the, of the treatment. In terms of this project, we obtain samples from Patricia, which are shipped over to UCLA. We have done this with fresh and frozen samples and saw no difference, so we are now uh, mostly shipping frozen samples. Once we receive the sample, we thaw them and we establish organoids. We have designed a number of different assays that we perform to validate the models. We perform histology and immunohistochemistry. We do perform catecholamine secretion assays. We do sequencing, again, to validate that the models are recapitulative of the features of the parental tumor. And lastly, we perform drug screening. Giving an update on the cohort so far, we have been able to test 10 samples. And those uh, represent a spectrum of age, gender, the location of the tumors, both pheochromocytomas and uh, extra adrenal paragangliomas. Size was also very variable. We have up until now only performed organoids of primary samples, but one of the tumors is recurrent, so it may eventually progress to metastasis. And the molecular subtypes are all represented. Uh, you can see on this image an example of two organoids and their primary tumors. In last year when we presented this project, we told you about the, the presence of markers that are expected to be seen in chromaffin cells cell cultures like chromogranin, and that these markers stay in ex being expressed throughout the culture. But we also detected additional cells in these organoids, like sustentacular cells, S100. And for example, one of the patients that had uh, one of the cultures that was negative happened to be from a patient that was primarily negative as well. So that was a recurrent tumor, a feature that remained in the organoid culture. 
we were also able to detect vascular cells, so endothelial marker CD34 was positive, and especially abundant in a case of pseudohypoxic tumor that is characteristically more angiogenic. So for the most part, the cultures retained the expression of the primary tumors, and that profile was kept throughout the culture. Uh, we also began to test the tumors for their capacity to produce catecholamines, and here's a, a graph of a tumor that was detectable, had the metabolites, norometanephrine and metanephrine, detectable throughout the culture until the last day. And we were able to also check the expression of PNMT, the enzyme that uh, converts norepinephrine in epinephrine and gives us a sense of the catecholamine maturity potential of the tumor, which remained positive to the end. So in our preliminary analysis of three tumors, all three uh, represented the same exact spectrum of catecholamine production in the primary tumors. But in this initial analysis, we have not yet normalized for the cell number. Other types of assays were performing to characterize these cultures is evaluating their growth in uh, over time. We have a machine learning based pipeline to quantify organoids and quantify the area they occupy in culture and we've performed that on a number of different samples. As you can see, we occasionally have very robust growth, so we're trying to adapt our um, algorithm to capture that, um, but it's a promising way we have to quantify growth in culture. We have also performed preliminary drug screenings on all the samples. We have performed drug screenings both on short-term as well as long-term culture for a number of different cases. And I just want to point out a few different features. For example, we did test CVD, which is one of the types of standard therapy that patients may receive. And we found that only two of the patients for the short-term culture we tested were actually um, showing a response to it. So we are capturing a high degree of heterogeneity. We have tested drugs um, that target HIF. And again, we have seen moderate responses and only in a few specific cases. And we have seen, for example, strong response to some CDK inhibitors in a small subset of uh, our samples. As I mentioned, we have tested both long and short-term culture, where the short is a one-week timeline and long is one month. And um, we are analyzing this data, so this is very preliminary, but we have cases in which, as you can see, there is basically no difference over the time in culture. And so we are trying to develop a model which we can potentially keep in culture longer and characterizing the way in which the response to drug changes is important. So overall, we have a way to measure drug sensitivities of these samples, which is reproducible and is highlighting some very unique biological features and can be performed both on short and long term culture to characterize how they change over time. So in conclusion, we have a platform that allows us to develop uh, viable tumor organoids from a variety of PPGL genotypes. We have uh, validated this culture, which are able to recapitulate the majority of the feature of the uh, parental tumor. And we are able to perform drug screenings that shows unique profiles and features. So where we're taking the project next, we'll continue our collection of samples for genetic analysis so that we can uh, have a broader analysis of the, how the tumors progress over time, expand our studies of the various different lineages that accompany the culture over time, and determine whether there is any preference for specific genotypes and how they grow. So uh, I would like to thank the NetRF Foundation for providing us support for this project. And our group at San Antonio, we are a field para clinical and research center of excellence. And our lab and clinical teams work very well together. Um, and I would also like to thank our other funding sources. And uh, I would like to thank my lab, in particular, the work you saw is performed by Twin, uh, Maite, AJ in the lab, as well as our genomic collaborator, Paul Booters. All right, so uh, do we have questions? Uh, go ahead. Brian Udge, uh, a surgeon at Sloan Kettering. And when we operate on these patients, um, we spend a lot of time um, trying to block their uh, catecholamine secretion. And I'm just wondering if you're able to, in your drug assays, shut down catecholamine secretion. 
Um, because right now we use alpha blockade, which is not terrific. And we often have patients with uh, blood pressure crises in the operating room. So I'm just wondering if you think, or if you've seen signals that uh, perhaps uh, inhibitors uh, that you're identifying could be uh, an alternative approach. Um, we have not yet tested. Th this is an interesting thought. Um, I think there is a, a whole group now that uh, thinks that alpha blockade is uh, questionably better than not having it before surgery. So there's there's always been this uh, uh, current in, in, in the school of people that think there's no a great benefit in terms of preparation for surgery. But what I, uh, I think you're getting at is whether inhibiting uh, growth could potentially inhibit catecholamine production as well. And we haven't tested that, but that is something that is interesting is on our pipeline to test as well. Great. Um, I'm going to ask a question that's, that's uh, on the chat, um, which is from uh, Simone April Mon. Uh, he asked, um, what sample size do you need uh, in order to do these assays? Is an FNA, which we don't do a lot of in FIO, uh, but it's kind of getting to scale, be sufficient? Can you multiplex with other downstream assays? Uh, and then, um, can is there a way to study the heterogeneity among the 3D aggregates of different sizes in relation to drug response, hypoxia, or proliferation? I guess they're asking whether or not hypoxia relates to the size of the culture. So okay. actually we have someone in house yeah, okay. who's going to try to address part of it okay. yeah. and I'll come back to you. Yeah, I think that what Patricia was telling us is that we have um, a project, well, this project is continuing and we want to, to explore the hypoxia um, cell culture conditions with these organoids, um, but we were waiting um, for the installation of the incubator, but it's something that we are going to explore soon, I, I guess. And also about the tumor sizes, uh, we work with different um, tumor sizes and we are able to establish organoids for, from, from all the tumor sizes. Great. Uh, Great. I, I love you. Thanks so much, Maite. Uh, I, I just wanted to add a quick thing in case uh, uh, that didn't come out. Uh, we will have an FNA sample uh, that we're going to be testing for culture. So that's going to test the limits of our uh, precision model. Thank you. So we'll go to Chrissy and then James. Uh, thank you. It's Chrissy Thurwell, University of Exeter. It's really, really important and exciting work. I've got a couple of questions around how long you were culturing in the, the, the drug assays. I think you said it was two days, and it's just what your thoughts were about that in terms of cellular turnover and doubling time and whether that's a, a, a useful time point. But then I know you then went on to the long-term culture. So it's just, um, do you have some information about the, the doubling time and whether a two-day culture is going to be informative for that? Um, and then, the, yeah, if you do that bit. Okay, so uh, we have done, so we, the the original thought was the doing it in a two-day term was, uh, was the original uh, uh, organoid protocol uh, that was applied to other tumors. So we tested that in fios and perigangliomas, but I totally hear your point. And we have also done drug screen on the longer term cultures of four weeks. And, 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 and those results may potentially be more clinically relevant. The cells have time to grow. Yeah, uh, with, uh, which I think we're gonna address next is uh, what are the cells that are uh, remaining positive until the end? Uh, is there kind of a, a, a mixed bag of other supporting cells more than the tumor cells themselves? So, we are planning to address that to, uh, to, to be sure of what kind of cells we're treating when we treat them at the longer term. Thank you. Just one very short follow-up question. Similar to Talia with the taking 50 to 100 SI nets to get an organoid, what's your success rate in getting the, the, the tissue and the organoid working? Yeah, so interesting. We only had three cases that we were unable to culture well. We came back to look at those. Those were tumors that had necrosis, hemorrhage calcification so we're avoiding those areas uh, and, and, and trying to learn from them but uh, we have not yet had any genotype or molecular type that did not lend themselves to culture so it's it's been quite successful thanks 
Uh, I, I think it would be nice if you could know what the SDH mutational status is of the of the patients, so that might tell you something, and that might also be useful in the context of hypoxia. And I also wondered, couldn't you grow these cultures with normal adrenal medulla tissue that you might might get from kidney transplants that would give you a good baseline? Uh, okay, so in terms of genotype, we do know the genotype. So the cultures that you've seen there, there are no STHs. We do have one STHD waiting to be cultured. So as, as uh, we mentioned on the presentation, Alice did, uh, we can freeze them and culture them when we have the enough batch so that to make it more meaningful to do uh, multiple at a time. So we have an STHD coming up to be tested. So, so we we haven't uh, we haven't done that. Although we cannot be in, in general, these tumors are capsulated. They are they are quite uh, uh, isolated from the rest in infiltration. We have not tested adrenal normal adrenal medulla, but the, but that's something interesting too. But Patricia, I, I had a question about um, we're call, when we've done this. It's been very hard to distinguish growth from aggregation. Uh, and so over time, the cells collect and the spheroids grow. So how are you able to distinguish actual cellular duplication and expansion from um, just the cells adhering together? We don't yet. And we are trying to uh, collect the cells, uh, at, uh, have more uh, samples of cells at the end of the culture or at times when they are supposedly in growth and, and try and analyze those. Uh, for um, numbers. Uh, Alice has a very interesting machine learning method to address uh, cell uh, numbers uh, rather than aggregate, and we'll, we'll be having that next. Yeah. And I really like James' suggestion of, of a normal adrenal uh, work. I, I find it kind of hard. The human adrenal gland is convoluted. It's hard to get the cells without lots of contamination, um, but it is a control that we need. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. So thank you. I, we're going to move into a discussion broad that you are welcome to ask questions of anybody up here. And I, I see that George has his hand raised. So you get to go first. So I was intrigued by Talia's comments that uh, many of the failures to grow ileal uh, 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 organoids uh, had fibroblasts out of them. Is that the same true with pancreatic neurogen tumors? Or is that unique to ileo? And if it is unique to ileo, can that be used as a model for mesenteric fibrosis? Yeah. Uh, so I do have examples of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors where they failed because of the fibroblast outgrowth, but it's not nearly the same proportion. It's not nearly as dramatic. Yeah. Um, so how often do you co-culture in these types of spheroid or organoid cultures? Because we know the microenvironment is important as well. Have you any experience with that for that? Yeah, so, so there are groups doing that with other tumor types, doing these co-culture experiments with immune cells or fibroblasts, endothelial cells. It's not something I've explored yet, uh, but it is something that, that we're looking at. So for example, there is a group at EMBL Barcelona that works on bioengineered uh, vasculature. And so we're planning to combine that with the organoids, but certainly not something we've looked at. I think different models will be amenable to this. The, the organoids will have to be a co-culture sort of experiment, right? But I think uh, Alice's and, and Patricia's model, for example, they have some of the stromal cells already there, that, which could be leveraged. Um, I actually think that, that it is a great idea, but I think we are just getting into this. Um, coming back on the small bowel neuroendocrine tumors and the fibroblasts, um, I think that's actually a very unique feature of small bowel neuroendocrine tumor because as all pathologists will tell us, they are actually uh, in the patient tumor, they are grow, grown in these nested pockets, as these nested pockets between fibroblasts. So um, my take on this is that actually the fibroblasts are, are, are very important for SPNet growth. And we don't know yet, but we are in the process of setting up these co-culturing co system to better understand the communication between the fibroblasts and um, the, um, the small bowel neuroendocrine tumors themselves. Um, so with your spheroid organoids, uh, but also for the fields, um, your experience, have you looked maybe at radio sensitization, sensitization because we know PRT, but also NIBG for PHOs, is one of the most effective uh, treatments? 
is it, can it predict how the patient might respond to therapy? Yeah, I, I can just say that uh, unfortunately uh, we haven't gone there yet. I think it's a great idea. Uh, we have a collaborator, uh, many collaborators in Iowa who are doing, um, working on PRRT and, and with the, the radio label ligands and also our collaborator here, Ali here next to you, um, is doing uh, um, fluorescent ligands and all that. So I, I think uh, it will be a very interesting uh, avenue to explore, but unfortunately uh, we're just like not there yet we're in the process of setting up these spheroids for um, you know uh, just doing uh, radiation experiments at the moment and maybe after that then we can coordinate uh, with the uh, radio label ligand afterward Thank you. well so my question was for Talia actually uh, regarding the efficacy of genetic manipulation in these organoid spheroid models and what are you using to uh, manipulate gene expression and how effective are you how effectively are you getting that into the cells are you getting pockets of, of alteration or or what yeah so, so that's a great question to ask me a year from now because okay. <laughs> we're working we're, out, we're working on it but and we're d working on different systems and you know there are some systems that are classically used in the organ field where you can transfect cells um, uh, transiently and to get the Cas9 and sgRNAs in and there you know really the system is based on then clonal selection of the cells that have the mutation um, but I think there are ways and we're working on ways now to try to make that more high throughput where you don't require that clonal selection but maybe you can learn from what's growing out uh, but I can't I can't say yet okay thank you and Poe do you have have you tried to do any uh CRISPR editing or knockdown in yeah, your spheroids? We have, but I think our colleagues in the broad are really the experts. Um, but we, we have, and, and I can just say by experience that, so actually using a uh, temporary knockdown, it, it works really well. So the siRNA experiments are, are easy to do. So they're not long term, but if you want to like test something uh, quickly and, and just for a short term knockdown, those work really well. Um, they can, you can get uh, pretty much 80, 90 percent knockdown with siRNA system with the spheroid, but of course, um, you know, trying to get the stable model, that's, that's always like the hard part. A simple question uh, for uh, Talia, the uh, ilium PDTOs, have you tried giving serotonin to those? Um, post -talk, you know? I wrote that down, <laughs> that I need to do that, yeah. And uh, more broadly, um, I was wondering if people thought, this is a follow-up to Chrissy's uh, comment, you know, a lot of these drug screens are two days or four weeks, and during that time frame, there's probably not even a tumor doubling of your spheroid or PDTO. And you guys are use, using viability as a uh, readout, right? So presumably you're looking for a cytotoxic drug that's killing these things that aren't dividing. I'm just trying to link that to what may ultimately happen in the clinic, because we don't really see cytotoxic drugs in patients where you're shrinking tumors significantly, except maybe Kate, Tem, and peanuts for a long time. So we're looking for a viability readout in a tumor that's not doubling. I, I'm just I just trying to link it to the human condition, how you might make it more, you know, tangible or realistic. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to step in and just ask you then a question because, you know, many of these tumors aren't proliferating quickly in the patients, right? So, I mean, it seems to me like that is a problem. How, how, that's why so many therapies are not working uh, because most chemotherapies, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that most classic chemotherapies are targeting proliferating cells. And so I, I agree with your question. I think that, that we need to think about what we're targeting and what we need. Um, and so maybe we do need something that will kill the tumor cells that are there so they don't metastasize or proliferate or progress enough. Um, some angles that I'm thinking about is, you know, maybe what we need to think about are what are the tumors that are going to metastasize and, and, and really cause more problems, right? How, how can we identify those and then prevent that? I, I think that's more what I'm thinking of. If you're thinking about just what, what are the drug assays that, are, that we're doing telling us, Maybe they're telling us that some of these therapies are killing the cells, but you know I haven't on the neuroendocrine on the LC neck. That's a different story, and that's where I've done most of my drug assays besides the EGFR inhibitor. I think maybe Poe and, and some other people could could talk a little bit more about the low grade tumors 
and the drug assays there? Uh, yeah, uh, so I, I think um, the, the unique feature of a lot of um, these uh, anti-neoplastic compound, um, a lot of them end up targeting, for example, DNA damage. And in the case of slow-growing neuroendocrine tumors, you can imagine the cell actually um, can actually go in and repair some of these damage. So that's why I think most of the time they are not sensitive to uh, these uh, anti-neoplastic compounds. Um, and, and I guess that's what we saw from our screen as well. Um, now, in terms of the assay and, and quantifying viability, uh, well, I mean, the, these are pseudo viability. We, we are using metabolic uh, markers, so it's kind of like a um, um, to uh, as a proxy to quantify how much cells they are. Um, the, I guess um, to see really cell death, you can actually see that morphologically. So usually, what we do is uh, we can take a picture of the, the spheroids and then um, you can actually tell by the, the quality of the, the spheroids if they are actually uh, viable or disintegrating. Um, you can also look at, um, for example, apoptosis marker, and that would actually tell you uh, a good indication of cell death. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not um, uh, disputing that you're not getting cell death in your cultures. I'm just sort of trying to say is like in patients, um, we don't really have drugs that yeah. are cytotoxic in nets. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the best agents we have are smetstatin analogs or um, everolimus, which are cytostatic. So I'm not sure how they would uh, read out in your assays, right? Because they're, they're not killing the cells. They're just keeping them not growing. So in your assays, they probably would be, show no effect, right? Correct. But they're probably the best effective agents we have in patients today. So. Hey, Eric, what, what you're really getting at is, yeah. is what is our positive control? Like, what do we know that we can use in humans? And then how do we relate that to the dish? And then that's where you would establish the assay around. And I think that's a really a critical step that needs to be addressed. I, I would like to comment on that as, as well, because this is, this is really, has been the, the one billion dollar question that we uh, have been uh, trying to address. So what are we killing? Uh, and is it killing the end point of our game, right? So what, what are we trying to achieve? So the, in general, the assays were created to provide a real time potential treatment for rapid grow, growing tumors. That's not the case here for FIOS and pariganglioma's. Uh, I'm just talking about our model as an example, but I, I think it applies to all the slow growing uh, um, nets. Uh, that what, 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 what should be our endpoint? What, what are we trying to achieve here? Is it just stability in growth? Is it uh, uh, reduced uh, functional uh, uh, potential, as in fios and periganglioma, is less catecholamine production. Uh, and I, I don't think anybody has a real uh, perfect answer to that. And I think we're learning as we go and, and as a group, as a community, trying to see, okay, what are the assays that would really be meaningful and, and relatable to the, to the patient? Uh, so it, we're, we're not quite at the point of answering that question uh, perfectly, but I just wanted to plug in our our uh, model as well. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to add that um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, these are in vitro systems, so they do have their own limitation. And I think I, I just want to um, really write, like point out really the importance of uh, the work that James is doing and other people who are doing uh, on the in vivo model, because as, 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 as patient tumor are growing in the in vivo organism, so it's not really just the tumor cells uh, death that is really contributing to, to the tumor growth and all that. So, so there, that's why I think um, we, do, we do need to, to focus on the in vivo model because uh, I think um, that is actually uh, much closer to, to patient um, therapy development. I'd actually like to follow up with James and just for a second. In your pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor CDK5 mouse, um, are there mice that actually develop both the non-functional and the functional tumors, or is it always one mouse develops non-functional and another mouse develops functional? They're truly heterogeneous. Does that work? Yeah. Uh, they're truly heterogeneous. They, uh, the largest majority of them are non-functional, which is the case in humans. Um, but blood work and insulin and, uh, and looking at uh, 
uh, these, these secreted hormones, uh, some, some uh, smaller populations are, are functional, but they seem to all make insulin. It's just some secrete it and some don't, which makes you wonder if the determinants of the problematic symptoms, um, you know, are outside of the, uh, uh, sometimes outside of the, what's driving the cells to proliferate. Uh, Ramesh, do you have a question? <clears throat> Hi, uh, I just wanted to follow up on your last point, Poe, and, and uh, pick up on the discussion, uh, you know, regarding what, you know, a, a sound positive control might be in, in these kinds of studies. So, so you mentioned that uh, in your uh, denominator of 160, 170 <coughs> compounds, 21 of them... Recording were, in progress. <laughs> 21 of them were active. Uh, against the small bowel spheroids. Uh, considering how difficult it's been to identify tractable therapies, that seems like a pretty high proportion. And I wonder if that's if you've tried that in vivo in, in your xenograft bottles, or irrespective of that, what you think about that hit rate and what it might actually tell us about the validity of those kinds of readings. Yeah, so uh, we have tried these. Uh, for, so of course we're, we're still um, uh, trying to use a SBNet model, and we're currently um, using the GOT1 model. And thank you so much for Yvonne from Sweden for sharing it with us. And uh, but uh, in the past we have tested with using the uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma PDX models that we developed, and these are uh, quite um, they, they express like SSTR. Two and a lot of the neuroendocrine tumor markers, and they, they I think they're like in the between, uh, as um, as you might have heard from Nanette, uh, Dr. Nancy Joseph was um, um, emphasizing on how hard it is to actually distinguish between the G3 net and the G3 neck that are actually also uh, having a lot of these uh, markers and it comes down to P53 and RB and that's why how they would classify it if it's a neck or a neck, a net. Um, but, but so we have used it. So the, the 21 drugs that were uh, SBNet um, that were sensitive uh, against the SBNet, they are all actually shared between the other groups as well. So that's why, so we have tested them and they do show uh, effect in vivo uh, using the mouse model. But I think, uh, yeah, there's definitely uh, a, a lot more work in, in that uh, field and in that direction. But do they have activity the same way that your TPH1 inhibitor is inactive in vitro but active in vivo? Yeah, unfortunately, we haven't gone to that resolution yet. So uh, may, I think it will probably uh, take a little bit, uh, a lot more work uh, going to that direction. Um, what I can say about the TPH1 is like, yes, we do. We have found um, that uh, several neuroendocrine tumors actually express TPH1. Um, so some of the pancreas, and I think we're, we're going to go into a talk that, that you know, some pancreas neuroendocrine tumor can uh, have high serotonin in production as well, as well as some lung neuroendocrine tumors as well. So. Can I, just a quick comment, I, I, you know, uh, just in general, uh, um, these cells are hard to grow. Um, we're, we're all frustrated by the, the limit, limits of having uh, cell-based models. Uh, the organoids and spheroids uh, uh, provide, you know, a, a bridge for it. But these cells are slippery too. They they tend to not want to be what we want them to be, and and often it looks like we're growing these cells and they become something else. And so you know the questions are what do you want to mutate or, or what do you want to do? Maybe these cells uh, prefer hypoxic environments. We're not 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 a, everyone is always pushing that, but uh, uh, certainly uh, where the cells are most problematic is when they have m metabolic errors uh, in metabolism. Um, but what we've tried to do is to is to say, well, look, you know, if we can get more specific neuroendocrine uh, cell type promoters to drive key uh, uh, proneoplastic pathways, maybe we can get more of these animal models, and then and then by pulling out the animal models into into cellular cultures, uh, then this will allow us to kind of get to a point where we can make a lot of animals quickly that have these tumors that will have a normal. 
uh, um, immune environment, but that turns out not to be so easy either. We've got a nice tag and we sort these cells and we put them into the animals, uh, at least uh, Rachel and, uh, has been doing this, and uh, it looks okay, but if you start to passage them, eventually you end up with something that's not at all what you started with. It's a sarcoma or something, and maybe that's from, from the, either the cells are de-differentiating and continue to de-differentiate, or there's some other cells that you're pulling out in that, in, in that kind of process. So it's it's, it's not easy in culture. It turns out it's not even that easy in a mouse if you're dealing with uh, a, a normal animal rather than a patient-derived xenograft. So I, I really think uh, Talia's uh, work trying to fin uh, identify the environment, what are the growth factors together with defining uh, the conditions in the right series of mutations to get these models growing either in cells or, or cultures are going to be the, I mean, uh, either in cultures or in, in, in mice are, are going to be key, but this is kind of the hard part. And, and you know, I are we going to get there? But I think as a group, if we work together and share uh, things back and forth, we, we, we might be able to push, push the envelope as hard as possible. All right. Thanks, everybody. This has been a fantastic opening session. Um, and Ramesh and Carl will lead the session on genetics. Thank you.